Come on, Dream Center. Can you give it up for Jesus? Come on, do you love him? Has he done something in your life worth? Come on, why don't you take about 15 seconds and give God some praise if you're grateful for what he's done in your life. He's an awesome, awesome guy. Why don't you grab a seat, smile at someone, tell them they look better looking than they did last week. I do have to warn you, if you haven't worked it out already, I do have an accent. I originally hail from Australia and uh, moved out here four and a half years ago. And uh, my wife, incredibly hot, stunning wife that I have, um, she came out to, someone agrees with me. I don't know if I should be scared or not. (laughs) But uh, me and my wife, Caressa, we have been married for four and a half years. It has been the greatest four and a half years of Caressa's life. <laughs> I've just been a blessing. And, uh, but we, uh, we, uh, we are based down in Orange County. And I'm so, so honored. I really mean that to be here today and uh, to be amongst you all, and of course to be, uh, to be here with Pastor Matt and Caroline. So grateful for you guys. Pastor Matt preached a message um, at an event that I was at uh, a few years ago, and uh, I'll never forget it. He talked about, uh, I don't know if it, the title of the message or not, but it was talking about I get to, and uh, talking about what it is to serve in the kingdom of God, that this is not something that we have to do, it's something that we get to do. And uh, it impacted me and changed me so much. And, and so I'm so grateful to be here. Such a huge honor. Can you join with me as we honor them and give it up for your pastors and for who they are? Love you. Appreciate you. Amazing, amazing, amazing people. Come on. You could have had any pastor in the world, but God gave you these people. So grateful. And uh, there's, there's certain people, I think, that, um, when you just get around them, you just feel better and you just feel built up and your spirit is stirred and, uh, and that's who they are for us. So, of course, having uh, Jim and Laurie Baker here as well is such a blessing and, and uh, it's such a huge honor, honor for me. And uh, I'm just, uh, you know, I, I often feel uh, a bit like a fish out of water. I'm, uh, I'm, I, I didn't grow up in a ministry home. Uh, my dad is an attorney. Uh, my mum is a psychologist. Uh, I didn't grow up. Um, in a spirit-filled home at the start either. I was an out-of-control teenager, um, rebellious. So when you're an out-of-control teenager and your mum is a psychologist and your dad is an attorney, that makes for an interesting combination. It means that your mum is a psychologist, so she studies the brain and human thinking, so she knows exactly what you're going to do before you do it. But what's good is your dad's a lawyer, so once you've done it, he can help you out in Jesus' name. Come on, somebody. And uh, so it was uh, was an interesting interesting upbringing, but I often feel like a fish out of water in the sense of that God would uh, would pick me up from Australia and uh, and put me here among such, such people of the faith and such legends. And, uh, and I just get to be a part of what God is, uh, what God is doing, and uh, I'm just so honored. Um, I have two, two children. I have a little son who's going to be two in November. His name is Luca, Luca James, and I have a daughter whose name is Leo Jacqueline. She's four months old. That's right. We have two children under two. We don't mess around in my home. Well, we do. That's how it happened, praise Jesus. But... Um, Praise God for a healthy marriage. But it is, uh, they are amazing. Four people just left your church. I'm sorry, I apologize. Let's get to the Word of God before it gets weird. Open your Bible. And uh, we're going to go to uh, the book of Ezra. And uh, I want to just share, uh, share something with you. And uh, I felt like uh, praying today, I was asking the Lord, and I felt like the Lord wanted me to come and bring a word to encourage you and to stir your spirit, and to build you up, and, uh, and I want to uh, just share from this story in Ezra, um, and let me just set it up for you, I'm not, I'm not going to read all of it, I'm just going to pull some, some parts of it out, but in Ezra chapter 3, um, speaking of the children of God, and the people of God at this time are in a sinful um, area, they're in Babylonian territory, um, they're not amongst uh, people that believe the same thing that they believe. 
Um, they um, often, maybe it's, it's how you feel going to work or going to school or going to college. You get pumped up in church. Um, and then, but then you, you go outside these doors and you'll, you'll find that you are surrounded by people that don't necessarily believe the same thing that you believe. But how many know that God has called us to take new ground and new territory every single where that we go? That we're called to be influencers, that we're called to make a difference, that we're not called to be intimidated by darkness. We're called to change the darkness, to bring the light of Jesus. So the darker the environment you might be in, the greater the opportunities are ahead of you to change that and be an influence. Um, and this is where they were. But God spoke to the king and said to the king, I'm going to, God spoke to the king and turned the heart, the Bible says, turned the heart of the king um, to allow this children of God to go back um, into their town, where they were from, and to establish or to rebuild the temple of God. God spoke to him and said, you're going to go back and I'm sending you with a mission, with a plan, with a purpose, and it's to establish my temple in this territory. It's to reestablish worship. And the Bible says in Ezra chapter 3 and verse 3, it says, though fear had come upon them because of the people of those countries, they set the altar on its basis and they offered burnt offerings on it to the Lord, both morning and evening burnt offerings. It says, though fear had come upon them because of the people that were around them, they began to establish worship once again and began to do what God had told them to do. That's a bizarre scripture because you would think that it would start by saying when they became full of faith, they stepped out and did what God told them to do. We talk like that in church a lot. We talk about, I felt full of faith, so I stepped out. I took a chance. I felt faith take over, so I believed and I stepped out. That's not what it says. It says, though fear came upon them, but they went anyway. One of the things that I think stops us from doing what God has called us to do is that we are waiting until we are full of faith. I want to tell you, I've found more often than not, when God tells you to do something radical, you're not going to be able to wait until you're full of faith. Because if I, if I was going to be full of faith, you have to understand that for faith to be required, there has to be some fear. That we cannot wait and hold back and wait until I'm, I'm full of faith. I've found more often than not, when I step out to do something for God, I know this will shock you, but I'm not full of faith. I'm probably 80% full of fear, but I've got a little bit of faith. Because the Word tells me I only need a mustard seed, so that's all I need to focus on. It's not about what you're full of, it's about what you focus on. And if you focus on the faith, you'll keep moving into what God has called you to do. A few years ago, I had this buddy that came and, and, uh, and he came and he said, Ben, he said, let's go skydiving. I said, bro, are you insane? He said, yeah, yeah. We're going to get in a plane and we're going to fly out with a parachute. We're going to jump out. I said, let's do it. Let's, let's do it. I love doing, doing extreme sports and things like that. So, so we went and, and we went to this place where they do skydiving. And, uh, and I went up there and we, we go up to register and, and, and talk to the person. And they said, um, you need to decide how you want to do the skydive. They said, there's different ways that you can do it. Um, they said, one way you can do it is what we call a tandem jump where what we will do is we will strap you to the instructor and, and you will jump out with the instructor. Now understand, I'm already feeling awkward about jumping out of an aeroplane, let alone jumping out of an aeroplane strapped to another man. Like, I don't even know him, you know? Like, like how does this work? Like, like do we talk? I mean, he, he's like right there. Like, what if he's got a beard and sitting my neck? It's like... I'm like, so do you skydive often? He's like, hey, you're like, Ooh. I said, is there another way we can do it? He said, yeah, you can do it. You can jump out by yourself. He said, but what I need to do is, he said, in order for you to jump by yourself, we have to do some training. I said, all right, let's do it. Let's do some training. So we go into this training. They have this huge training facility. 
And they have all these dressing rooms. He says, go into the dressing room and you'll find a jumpsuit that I need you to put on. So I went and I, I got this jumpsuit. If you don't know what a jumpsuit is, it's, it's basically like a onesie. You know a onesie with a zip? Only problem was mine was just a little bit too small for me. If you have a t-shirt and your t-shirt is too small, it's not that bad. You know, you just make adjustments. If you have pants and they're too small, that's still not that bad. But when everything's connected... It's like the wedgie from hell. There's no relief. I'm in the dressing room and I've got my, my onesie on and, uh, and they come out and, and, and everyone comes out. So I come shuffling out and, and, the, and the guy comes up and he hands me a helmet. He hands me a helmet. I looked at him and I'm like so confused. I'm like, bro, are you for real? And he says, yeah. He says, put the helmet on. I said, Why? I'm about to get in an aeroplane and they're going to fly this aeroplane to 14,000 feet in the air. Let me tell you something. If I jump out and my chute doesn't open, knowing that I'm wearing a helmet, it's not going to make me feel much better. Can you imagine? You jump out. You reach terminal, you've jumped out 14,000 feet, you're falling through the air, you reach terminal velocity speed, you pull your ripcord and your chute doesn't open. You're like, oh no, I'm going to die, I'm going to, oh no, wait, wait, wait. I've got my helmet, everything's going to be alright. I just have to land on my head and we're going to be okay. He gives me the helmet, I've got my jumpsuit, I've got my helmet and, and we, we, we go through all of these these other things we're, we're learning about planes and we're learning about air pressure and we're learning about how to read an ultimeter, know when to pull a ripcord. We practiced everything. And we're about to go out to the plane and, and it suddenly occurs to me, we haven't practiced the parachute opening. <laughs> like I don't claim to be an expert on skydiving, but that to me would seem to be a pretty important part of this whole scenario. So I said to him, excuse me, Mr. Parachute Man. Can we, can we, we, we haven't practiced the parachute opening. Like, don't get me wrong, the helmet's awesome and, and this jumpsuit's doing interesting things to me right now. But, 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 but can we practice the parachute opening? And he says this to me, he looks at me and he said, we cannot practice that. I said, what do you mean? He said, the parachute is only designed to release when you jump out of the plane. Yeah. I said, what? <laughs> he said, we won't know your chute is going to open until you jump. Yeah. He said, if I pull your ripcord right now, he said, nothing's going to happen because the chute is only designed to release with the pressure of the upward wind as you're falling through the air. See, some of you are holding back in the things of God, waiting for God to show you what it's going to look like. You're standing in the training room of life saying, God, if you show, I'll go. And God says, that's not how it works. Faith without works is dead. God says, you go and I show. It's time for some of us to step out of the comfort of what we're used to and recognise that God has something supernatural for us to do and in order for us to unlock supernatural and make a difference we got to step out and dare to believe that he is the God that we read about in scripture that he is our heavenly father that he will not let us down that he's there for us he's guiding us he's directing us and he so has something amazing for you to do these people said, though fear has come upon me, I'm still going to do what God has called me to do. Not because I feel it, because faith isn't a feeling. Faith is about being obedient. And I'm not going to wait until I feel it. I'm simply going to be obedient and I'm going to do it. So they stepped out. Though fear had come upon them. And so they start to build. They start to believe. They start to activate. And it says further down as you follow the story in chapter 4 and verse 4, as they're building, it says, Then the people of the land tried to discourage the people of Judah. 
They troubled them in building. Discouragement is such a powerful thing. Discouragement can cause you to second guess your purpose in an instant. Discouragement can cause you to question the promises of God in just a moment. You can get so pumped and so excited in church and walk out and discouragement can literally snatch that seed of God's word away so quickly. I found so it can be so easy sometimes to be discouraged. This is what the enemy was trying to do. The enemy was trying to discourage them from their purpose, discourage them from their calling. That's what the enemy tries to do. The Bible talks about the enemy being the, the subtle schemes of the enemy, the subtlety of the enemy that would try and come and discourage you in what God has called you to do. To try to get your focus onto something else. If God, if the enemy can get you focused on what someone else is doing and what and lane that someone else is running and get your focus of what God has called you to do, you can get so discouraged. Do you ever start feeling good about how you're going in life and then jump on Instagram and all of a sudden you start looking at the highlight reel of someone else's life and start comparing your life to theirs? You've just finished, you've had this knockdown, drag out fight with your wife or your husband and you jump on social media and there's your best friend and they're like in flipping Paris or something and she's in a bikini and he's just got a tan and they're like doing this little selfie. It's not real. Do you know what I wish? I wish someone would start an Instagram, hashtag real life, and do a real life marriage photo where you and your wife have just spent all day yelling at each other. She's in bed with the flu, with makeup running down her face. The kids are going crazy. you got dirty diapers everywhere. Haven't done the washing for a week. Floor needs to be vacuumed. I want to post a selfie of that and just say, hashtag real life. This is what it's really all about about compare yourself to this and you'll feel a lot better with where you're really at it's not it's it's not real yet the enemy can come in and cause us to be so discouraged comparison will discourage you so quickly I learned that when I started preaching in Jensen Franklin's pulpit I had to learn that lesson real fast As a communicator, we can get so caught up as communicators comparing how I preach to how someone else preaches. You know what I've realized? I do a really bad everybody else. I can't do, I love Pastor Joel Osteen. I love Pastor Matthew Barnett. I cannot do Pastor Matthew Barnett. I can't do this. I wouldn't be able to get up and do a Joel Osteen. I cannot do a T.D. Jakes. I wish I could. But do you know what I can do? I will get up and give you the best Ben Prescott you have ever seen in your life. Whether you like it or not, it doesn't matter. But I do it better than anybody else on the planet. Why? Because I am me. Tell someone, you do you. You be comfortable doing you. That's where the touch of God is. God has not anointed you to be anybody else. Be who you are. That's where the power is. That's where the anointing is. That's where the touch is. The enemy came to try and discourage and said that they, they troubled them in building and hired counsellors against them to frustrate their purpose. What this story is actually talking about, these people were trying to build the temple so they would submit plans similar to how you would have to submit plans if you were building nowadays, you would submit plans to the city. And what these people were doing is they were paying city officials to delay, delay the plans from going through. Second thing the enemy will try to do after he tries to discourage is to try to delay your purpose. We can get so pumped up what we believe God is going to do in and through us. But we get so fixated upon our timeline about when he's going to do it. See, I found that what we need to do is we need to trust his plan 
and not ours. The Bible says that his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. Jesus continually changed the process and the pattern of how he did things. One, one, one moment Jesus would heal somebody and he would just simply lay hands on them. The next moment, he would just speak a word. He didn't even have to go there. He would just speak a word. The next moment, someone gets healed by touching the bottom of his garment. The next moment, he prays for a dude who's blind by spitting in the mud and putting the mud on his eyes. Jesus continued, continually changed the way in which he would heal because he didn't want people putting their faith in the process. He wanted people putting their faith in the person of Jesus Christ. He wanted people saying, God, it doesn't matter how you do it because my faith is not in the process. It doesn't matter how, it doesn't matter when. I just trust you and I know that you are faithful and you will deliver and I trust your plan and I trust your purpose. That when the enemy tries to hold back and delay that business from growing where you thought it was going to be, and the enemy is trying to delay that breakthrough that you're believing for, I came to encourage somebody tonight to tell you, don't give up, keep seeking, keep walking, keep believing, keep praying, keep declaring. It's not dead, it's not over. God's in control, trust His timing. Don't give up, you're about to get a victory in Jesus Christ name because God is faithful he's faithful to his word he's faithful to his promise and when it feels like it's delayed don't give up because God's hand is still on it he tries to discourage he tries to delay and then he tries to just disconnect disconnect you from your calling where we get so discouraged we get so delayed we just give up completely I went recently uh, about Christmas time I was with uh, I was with Pastor Jansen and we were over in uh, Georgia for um for Christmas and uh, Pastor Jansen loves football and uh he's a uh, Atlanta Falcons fan and uh he uh he said to me do you want to go to a football game I said let's do it I'm down I'd been to one football game um it was a college game uh, but I'd never been to an NFL game. So I said, let's do it. Let's, let's go. So I'm pumped. Um, and so he, he, he was friends. He was connected with, with one of the players um, in the Atlanta Falcons team called Julio Jones. And uh, he said, we're going to go. And uh, we're going to be sitting in Julio Jones's family's box in the game. Now, of course, that means nothing to me because I don't know anything about football, Julio Jones, or the box that his family has. But he says, we're going to go, we're going to go, and we're going to sit in this. So I'm excited. I'm like, awesome, let's, let's go. I'm, I'm, I'm ready to go. I'm pumped. So we get in the car, and we drive down to Atlanta. But on the way down there, um, it occurs to me, I had all like this, this revelation of how much I don't know about football. And the fact that I'm about to go into a box where I'm going to be surrounded by people who all know a lot about football. And, and so I thought, this, isn't, this is not good because it's Julio Jones's box and his family's in there. And, and I don't want to be like the awkward, you know, Australian that knows nothing. So I need to come up with a, a plan or a strategy of some sort. And so I thought to myself, you know what I'm going to do? I'm, I'm just going to watch what everybody else does in the box. And whatever they do, whenever they do it, I'm going to do the exact same thing at the exact same time. You can't lose. So when they stand up, I'm going to stand up. When they get upset with the referee, I'm going to get upset. I won't know what I'm getting upset about, but that's the spot beside the point. I'm just going to do what everybody else is doing. So, so this, this was my plan. I walked in. I didn't even tell Pastor Jensen this because I thought I'm going to fake it till I make it, right? Maybe I'll, I'll fool him as well. And so we, we got in the box and, and I'm sitting down there. And so they sit me right beside, I'm sitting right beside Julio Jones's mum. You know she's about to make some noise, right? And so I thought I'm going to do whatever this lady does. God bless her. I'm going to be right on her tail doing exactly what she's doing. So the game starts and, and it starts and it's exciting and people are yelling and, and she stands up. So I stand up. 
And she looks like she's looking at something on the field. So I'm looking at something on the field. I'm just watching a cool corner of my eye. I got you. I got you. I'm like this. Something happens and she's like, I can't believe it. I'm like, I can't believe it. I don't know what I can't believe, but her boy's out there playing and, and, and she, starts, she starts yelling. I start yelling. I wasn't saying exactly the words that she was saying, but that's okay. You know, I was, I was doing my version of it, right? And then I started to develop some momentum it's, uh, because it started to work. So I started getting more and more excited. Like people, I'm yelling random obscenities at, at players. I have no idea why I'm yelling at them. One, one, guy, one guy in the box stands up and says, I don't know what this means, but he stands up and he says, first down, let's go. Now, I don't know what that means. But I was so pumped and so excited I get up and I'm like, first down, baby, let's go, whoop. Like, I, I, honestly, I said whoop. At the, like, what is that? I, don't, I saw someone do that as well. I, first down, one, one guy stands up during the game and says, that's it, we're going all the way, baby. I'm like, yeah, we're going all the way, baby. Like, we, I don't know football now, I'm on the team. Like, what am I doing? I don't know what I'm, but, but, but you know what I noticed? is what I noticed was, as I was watching, and I was watching what all of the fans were doing, I noticed something. You have players out there on the field. That some of these players are making in excess of $15, $20 million a year. These guys are fit. These guys are trained. These guys are prepared. These guys are strong. They know what they're doing. And I would look at some of these fans standing 20 feet away on the other side of the fence. I saw one guy that probably weighed about 300 pounds and had never run a lap in his life. Had a beer in one hand and a hot dog in the other with ketchup on his face. Hanging over the fence. Telling one of these athletes, you suck. I stood there and I thought, really? Can you see yourself? You are fat as a house and would not be able to run one lap around this field and you're telling this guy that he sucks? Do you know what I've never seen? You know I've never seen? Tom Brady, people tell me Tom Brady is one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time. Paid, paid, paid in excess of $25 million a year. Maybe he's not. I don't even know who he is. Do you know what? I watched it. I, I know enough to see. I, know, I saw him at the super, on the Super Bowl, right? Do you know what I didn't see Tom Brady do in the Super Bowl? In fact, I'll dare say you will never see Tom Brady do or not one NFL foot player, football player do. I'd never seen Tom Brady get the ball. He's about to throw it. And when that 300-pound guy who's on his sixth beer with ketchup on his face leans over the fence and yells out at Tom Brady and says, You suck. I'd never seen Tom Brady stop and go like this. What? What did, no, guys, shh. Hey, hey, just wait, wait, wait. What, what, what did you say? Did you just say that we, I suck? What do you mean that I suck? Why, why are they paying so much for me to be out here if I suck? If I suck, what am I doing with the ball? What are we going to do? Guys, guys, hey, listen. This dude said that we suck. Should we stop the game? Should we go home? What am I going to tell Giselle? What, like, what are the kids going to think? I mean, this is just embarrassing. Like, like we, we what, what? See, it sounds silly, but the problem is I see Christians do it all the time. That you have a purpose. That you have a call. That you are gifted. That you are anointed. 
that you were prepared for this moment right now. And let me tell you something, the devil has never once done a single thing for God in his whole entire life. So why when he leans over the fence and tells you you're not worth it and tells you to give up, why are you dropping everything that God has called you to do and entertaining something that comes from the pit of hell? It's time for some of you to tell the devil to go back to hell where he came from and remind him that you're called, you got a purpose, you got anointing, and you're about to do what God has called you to do in Jesus Christ's name. You don't suck. Your purpose, your destiny is in front of you. God has called you. God has anointed you for this moment. Quit listening to the enemy. Eve's biggest mistake was not eating the fruit. Eve's biggest mistake was having a conversation with the snake in the first place. That's where she messed up. Did God really say, shut your mouth. You're not even worth me talking to right now. It's the subtle scheme of the enemy. Notice how the enemy comes in and asks a question to Eve. Just what's he doing? He's asking a question to try and invoke a line of thinking. It's a subtle scheme. What's it sound like for our life? Are you really going to build that business? Are you really free? I know they sing about it, but don't you still struggle with those thoughts in your mind? Don't you remember the family that you came from? Didn't your dad battle with that same addiction? So how are you going to be free? Are you really going to find the spouse that God has called you to marry? What, who, haven't, you, haven't you been divorced? How are you going to? This is, the, this is how the enemy can come in and disconnect us from what God is calling us to. You know what I learned? And Keith can come. I'm going I'm to wrap it up. You know what I learned, though, about football was, <laughs> among many other things that day, I learned something they told me about college football. They told me in college football, because what happens is the crowd can actually get so noisy. And what what the crowd actually does in college football is when the team is about to, the team are trying to communicate to one another in regard to the play that they're going to do. What will happen in college football, it happens in NFL as well, but but. It happens in a big way in college football. The whole crowd will begin to scream on the opposite, the opposite team members' fans will begin to scream at that very moment that the team members are trying to communicate. Because what they're, and many of you who watch football will know what I'm saying is true. What the crowd is trying to do is they're trying to make so much noise that the team cannot communicate. They're trying to make so much noise. They recognise that that moment right there is pivotal. They recognise that this is there in a, this is a window right now, where they're about to make a play that's going to shift things in this game. And we need to make some noise, and we need to make some noise right now. God told me today to tell some of you that you're in a window season right now. You're about to make a pivotal play over your life and for your family and for your life right now. And that's why the enemy's trying to drown out the play over your life. But this is what I learned. This is what I learned. Do you know what they do? Do you know what they do? In college football, it gets so loud when they're trying to communicate that it's actually impossible for them to hear what the play is. So do you know what they do? The coach and the coaching staff, they make little little signs and they write the play down on the signs. So in the middle of all the craziness, all the players need to do is just look to the side and read the play. You know what this is? It's a book of plays. Listen, listen. I I wrote some up for you. 
I did some, I, I just, because this is what I do for me sometimes. And I want to do it for you tonight. When you wake up and you start questioning, what am I going to do with my life? And you start questioning and you look at the issues and the baggage and the things that you're carrying and start to question your purpose and start to question your destiny and don't know what tomorrow is going to look like and you don't know who you're going to marry and you don't know what you're going to study and you start getting full of fear and full of anxiety. Can I tell you what you need to do? You just need to drown out the noise and just just read the play. This is, this is the play. It's Jeremiah 29, 11. It says, you don't have to worry about the plans for your life because they're not your plans, they're my plans. So don't worry about what you're hearing from the crowd. Just focus on the play. Sometimes I go through times where I don't know how I'm going to do it. I don't know how to be a good pastor. I don't know how to be a good dad. I don't know how to be a good husband. And I'm trying the best that I can. But the enemy will start to yell and say, you don't know what you're doing. See, you can keep trying, but you're not going to make it. And then God, God told me something one day. It's just this. It's just, it's just simple. I know this is not rocket science, but it's the Word of God. It's powerful. Philippians 4.13, it says, I can. I can. No, no, no. I can do some things if I try really hard. No, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. So... I started making some plays. My, my wife, when we, got, when we got married, when we got married, my wife was, had been going through challenges. She, she preaches now. She talks about eating years of struggling with eating disorder and, and how the enemy, when we stepped into pastor in the church, the enemy, it's, it's, it's interesting that the things that you defeat in, the par, in your past that you buried years ago when you step into your calling and your future and your purpose. It's interesting that those things that you were dead and buried from the past will come trying to chase you down. Remember when the Israelites came out of Egypt? And then they came chasing them down, didn't they? And I remember her speaking to me and, and her saying, man, I'm just struggling. The enemy's coming after my mind. It made me so mad. I thought, I don't know who the devil you think you are. Sometimes the devil's got some Cajonas, didn't he? Am I allowed to say that? This might be the last time you ever see me again. I thought, who do you think you are coming into my house? Coming after my wife, you mangy punk. So I got a Sharpie and I wrote, I wrote, a, I wrote a play for my wife on a mirror. And you know what I just wrote? It's just a simple play. I just wrote, you're fearfully and wonderfully made. Because I wanted her looking at herself filtered through the Word of God. I wrote, I wrote last two and then I'm gonna, we're going to pray and we're going to close. You know, sometimes, sometimes I, gotta, I, gotta, uh, I just put Scripture in just, just a language, just a simple. Sometimes you just got to You just got to remind yourself, I wrote this one down for me. I know, listen, listen. It's so, it's not, it's, it's not, there's nothing super complicated about it. But sometimes the best thing that you need to hear is the simplest thing. Sometimes it's just that reminder from your heavenly Father that you're going to make it. That I came to just preach that as a simple message to someone here tonight. You're going to make it. 
Your marriage is going to make it. Your business is going to make it. Your mind is going to make it. It's not going to end the way the devil is telling you it's going to end. Jesus Christ came and hung on a cross so that you could make it. Someone here is walking through all hell right now. And the enemy is coming at you from every angle. Don't give up. Keep going. Keep believing. Keep building. Keep declaring. Keep reading. Keep praying. Keep walking. And I want to tell you, everywhere you go, God said to Joshua, everywhere you set your foot, I'm going to give it to you. So you're not walking in vain. You're walking in victory because God goes before you. He makes a way where there seems to be no way and you're going to win. I wish I could get a few people that would believe God enough to declare over your life that you're going to make it. Won't you give Him praise right now? Won't you lift your hands if the enemy's been trying to tell you otherwise? I dare you to praise right now like you've just come through with victory, like you've just come through the battle, like you've overcome the storm. And right across this room with every head bowed and every eye closed, there's people in this room you felt like giving up and you don't even know why you came tonight. It's random that you would even be here. Someone invited you. You felt like giving up. Maybe you're here every week and you feel like giving up. You feel like giving up on your marriage. You feel like giving up on your business. Someone here has been battling depression for so long has stepped now into suicidal thoughts where the enemy will come at you and a darkness will come over you in the night. I want to tell you, you have victory over that. That's not a mental thing. That's a spiritual thing that you have victory over through the blood of Jesus Christ. There's people here in this room where hopelessness and despair is trying to bind you up and hold you down. I dare you right now in this room to raise both hands to heaven as a declaration that says, God, I cannot do it on my own, but I'm not going to try and do it in my strength. I'm doing it in your strength. I declare it now in Jesus' name. I pray it over every single person in this room. I declare victory over this atmosphere. I declare purpose. I declare destiny. And I declare the name of Jesus Christ that is higher than any other name. And right now in this room, Lord, in this amazing atmosphere of your presence, I ask Holy Spirit, Lord, you're the comforter. You're the counselor. Will you come and do right now what only you can do? God is bringing peace upon people's minds and your thinking right now. The Word says, Whom the sun sets free shall be free indeed. Someone's walking out of here free tonight in Jesus Christ's name. Lord, we love You. Lord, we praise You. God, we thank You for victories right now in this room. We claim it right now and I declare victory over every single person. In the mighty, mighty name of Jesus. And if you believe it and you receive it, I want you right now for about 15 seconds to give God the greatest shout of praise. Like you know that you just got set free because of the power of the Word of God. Come on, praise Him.